All right, so now what we're going to be talking about is phases and energy bar diagrams. The first one is more of a review, and um, it is over the three main phases of matter. We're not going to be talking about plasma in this class, so don't worry about it. All right, the first phase of matter that we're going to talk about is a solid. And what, what we want to focus on is how is a solid different from a liquid from a gas? And those main ways are through their arrangement. So how are the particles arranged? How are they attracted to one another? And how do they move? For a solid, they are packed tightly together, which means they are right next to each other. There's no space in between, basically. They are also extremely attracted to one another. So one particle really likes touching or being next to the next particle. And then the motion, as far as movement, they're just vibrating back and forth. They are actually moving. So even if you're looking, if you could go all the way into an atom of something on like your desk, you would actually see these um, particles moving back and forth. A liquid, on the other hand, they are somewhat close together. So they're not touching as much as a solid, but they are somewhat close to each other. And then they have little attraction to one another. So they're not totally repelled by each other, but they, um, and rep repulsion is different than it. It's the exact opposite, actually, of attraction. But they, they don't feel each other as much. Like, think of magnets. So for solids, these magnets are really strong magnets and really want to be right next to each other. For liquid, they're more weaker. You don't really have that same attraction. And the motion, what you could kind of say is they move by vibrating and spinning. They also flow, okay? So they kind of flow over one another. Think of like flowing water. That's what's happening is these particles are moving and flowing over one another. On the other hand, a gas. A gas is the particles are extremely far apart, okay? They have almost no attraction with each other, meaning if you have one particle by another one, it, it doesn't even phase it. Like it's not attracted or repelled by it. It just is there, okay? And then motion, they totally completely move randomly and they take the shape of the container. Whereas a solid maintains its shape and its volume regardless of the container. So if I put a stapler in one container and then I move the stapler into another container, it would still have its exact same shape and volume. A liquid maintains its volume, okay, but it does not maintain its shape. So if I had a long skinny tube and I poured the liquid in that long skinny tube into a wider, um, a wider tube, it would now take the shape of that new container, but its volume would remain the same as what it was in the previous one. So what you want to do with this guy is you want to be able to draw these particles along with the characteristics. So what we talked about with gases is this is a gas and a liquid, a container and a solid, okay? A gas has no attraction to each other and they're extremely far apart. So we've got these gases that are extremely far apart, okay? For a liquid, we have them somewhat attracted to one another, little attraction, but um, somewhat. And then they are more flowing with each other. And then with solids, you have them completely attracted to each other, and they are right next to each other. In order to show vibrations, we just kind of do squiggles. In order to show the flow, you kind of add like one little kind of particle movement. And then gases kind of make them faster, straighter, they're more direct, they're not flowing. They're just moving their own way that they want to. As far as density goes, as we've already learned, the density of a gas is extremely low. So it has a very low density. A liquid has the medium density. And then a solid is dense, is the most dense, I guess you would say. Most dense. As far as compressibility, meaning can you change its volume, both liquids and solids, you cannot change the, um, cannot compress it. With a gas, you can easily compress it. All right, with phase changes, you are going to need to know these terms. I would say the first four are extremely familiar to you. Melting, I always try to think of when I'm trying to do a phase change, which is a transition from one phase, solid, liquid, or gas, to another phase, solid, liquid, or gas. I always think of water because I'm very familiar with it. So when I think of water going from a solid to a liquid, that'd be ice going to liquid water. That's called melting. When you go from a liquid to a gas, that's evaporation or vaporization, if you'd like to say. Um, condensation is when you go from a gas to a liquid. I always think of in the shower 
or on a mirror, the water, the steam that I created from the shower is now going to be condensing on the mirror. Freezing is when you put water into the um, fridge, so it goes from a liquid to a salad, or I mean a freezer. And then deposition and sublimation are a little weird. Um, deposition is, is when you convert from a gas to a solid. What they actually believe is that snow is made by the process of deposition. And that's why when you're ever on like a fake, um, fake snow, like skiing, it doesn't feel the same as real snow. And the reason why is because we don't undergo that freeze or that deposition process of going straight from a gas, gaseous water into a solid for the snowflake. Sublimation is when it goes from a solid to a gas. Um, one that you're probably very familiar with is um, dry ice, which is carbon dioxide, solid carbon dioxide, and then it goes into a gas. Um, that's what creates that foggy stuff is the gas of carbon dioxide. The other thing, um, another one that does it is iodine. It's this beautiful purple pellet, and then you heat it up, and then it goes straight into a purple vapor. And then another one it, that I've read about is actually a diamond. There is no liquid diamond. It literally goes straight from a solid into a gas, but that's extremely high temperature. So here's just a visual of what um, the previous few slides have shown. And that's where you go from a solid to a liquid to a gas. And when you're going from a solid to a liquid, it's called melting. When you're going from a liquid to a gas, it's evaporation. I would just write this down and it's a great visual as with everything in this class. Anytime we can visually draw something, it's always great for um, our memory. All right, some different terms that you should know about with states of matter. One is um, what is the difference between gas and vapor? A lot of people think that they mean the same thing. Well, they don't. A gas is actually something that exists in the gaseous state at room temperature. Whereas a vapor is where it currently is a gas, but it typically does not exist at that state at room temperature. So like that's why we call it carbon dioxide gas, because carbon dioxide at room temperature typically is going to be a gas, whereas we call it water vapor. And the reason why we call it water vapor is because um, water typically is a liquid at room temperature, whereas if we see it at a gaseous state, um, it now is considered a vapor. All right. Liquid terms, uh, there are a few ones we want to know. It's vaporization, evaporation, and boiling. Vaporization is just any conversion between a liquid to a gas or a vapor. So that's the general, like all rectangles are square, or all, all squares are rectangles, but all rectangles are not squares, whatever. But it's kind of like this one. So vaporization is any conversion between a liquid to a gas or a vapor. Evaporation, on the other hand, is just when it's occurring on the surface and it's not boiling. So it's literally just peeling off those layers, the top layers of a liquid, um, and those top layers are being converted from a liquid to a gas, but not like at the bottom or throughout. Then we've got boiling, and boiling is when it's throughout. A uh, boiling point occurs. So something boils when you see all these bubbles in a pot, okay? Boiling occurs when the liquid is being trans converted into a gas. But when does that happen? It happens when the pressure, the outside pressure of the gas or of the air basically on Earth is the same as the gas pressure in the liquid. Okay, And that's when boiling can occur. So if you have less pressure, like you're higher up on a mountain, you're not going to have as many of these guys okay, pushing down. So therefore, what happens is you can actually boil at, an, at a lower temperature, okay, because these guys, these gas particles don't need to create as much pressure because the pressure on the outside is um, lower. Uh, Mount Everest, for example, you can start boiling at 78 degrees Celsius, whereas um, in like Illinois or at sea level, you can do it at 100 degrees Celsius. So when you go up in the mountains, you have less pressure, okay, pushing down on the liquid. So therefore, the pressure that the liquid needs to do can be less. All right, we're also going to be talking about energy bar diagrams. And energy bar diagrams, I'm going to refer to them as LOL diagrams. And you'll notice why it's LOL in a few slides. But basically what it does is it accounts for where is the energy stored um, during a phase change or a chemical change, and where is it transferred to, okay? So where was that energy stored? Was it in the phase? Was it in temperature? Where was it? And then where is it transferred to? to the chemical bonds, whatever, okay? 
So in order to do this, what you need to do is you need to focus on what is the system and what is the surroundings. The system is the part of the universe that you are currently studying. So the only thing that you personally care about. So if I'm studying um, water, then it's the water. If I'm studying um, you know, a particular reaction, then it's just that reaction. The surroundings is everything around it. So it's everything, it's the earth, it's the air, you know, it's everything that you're not actually studying. And that's what's in the LOL, it's inside the O for the system and it's outside the O for the surroundings. Once again, I understand that this makes very little sense until you actually um, start doing an LOL diagram. All right, there are three types of energy that you are going to need to become very familiar with in this class. These are the chemistry types of ones. Um, there is phase energy, thermal energy, and chemical energy. And we abbreviate phase energy as EPH, thermal energy as ETH, and chemical energy as ECH. So we're not very original. They're pretty obvious to understand what it is. What is phase energy? Well, different phases, solid, liquid, gases, have different amounts of energy. Solids have less, liquids have more, gases have the most. And why? Because it's all dealing with the, the energy due to the arrangement of the particles. So because these guys are arranged differently, either close or far apart from one another, they have different amounts of energy associated with them. So as you move them further apart, they're gonna gain more energy. The thermal energy, okay, is dealing with your temperature, okay? And it's directly related to your temperature and it's the energy stored by the movement of these particles because things move faster, you have a higher temperature. Um, if things are moving slower, you have a lower temperature. If they're moving faster, they have more energy. If they're moving slower, they have less energy. Makes sense. If you have more energy, you tend to move faster than if you have no energy, then you move slower. Um, and how you change it is you change your thermal energy by changing its temperature. Chemical energy is the energy stored due to chemical bonds. Because in this chapter, we are actually, so how you change chemical energy is you break or make bonds. So you break a bond within a particle or you make a new bond within a mixing new particles together. Because all we are dealing with in this um, particular unit is phase changes, we are not going to be changing anybody's, um, any particles composition. So if we start with water, we're gonna be ending with water. As a result, your chemical energy will always be the same. You are not breaking or making bonds within an individual particle, okay? You are just going to be breaking attractions between particles of each other. So it's kind of like I can break this attraction between each other, that's a phase, whereas a chemical energy would it be, I'd be like separating this guy from each other. So in this chapter, we're actually not really gonna be dealing with chemical energy changes, that's more next semester. So this is what an LOL diagram looks like. This is your ETH, so this is your thermal energy, your phase energy, and your chemical energy. This is what initially happens, and this is what finally happens. Your energy flow is how you're accounting for, did you get in energy or did you lose energy? This is the key to identifying whether it's going to be an exothermic reaction or an endothermic reaction. Inside here is your system, and outside is your surroundings. So here are your surroundings outside, um, your system is on the inside. When I ask you to fill out a phase, um, or a phase energy bar, you need to know that in this class you have specific ones. This is the only time you have to be specific and exact on which um, on the amount of bars that you fill in. For a solid, by definition for this class, we are going to say a solid because it is the least amount of energy has one bar. A liquid has two bars. And a gas, because it has so much more energy compared to a liquid, um, will have four bars, always. So if we're going from a solid to a liquid, I better see one bar going to two bars. All right, so what does that mean if, if you have a no thermal energy? Well, thermal energy, once again, is the movement of the particles. So what you're telling me is if you have no thermal energy, no bars on your ETH, you have no movement which means that these particles are not moving at all, which means that they have um, reached the point of absolute zero, which is known as zero Kelvin, okay? Absolute zero is, is when no all motion ceases of the particles, okay? And it is zero Kelvin, which is also known as negative 273 
degrees Celsius. This is the coldest temperature possible. Why is it the coldest? Because if all motion ceases and temperature is the measurement of how things move and you have no motion, then you have no other temperature after this point. So zero Kelvin is as low as you can go. This is also known as absolute zero. And it is at negative 273 degrees Celsius. You do need to know all that. Chemical energy, if chemical energy was zero, that means you have no bonds, basically. You have no bonds to break or make. In this class, we will never have that. All right, so let's complete an LOL diagram for heating of water. So heating, what I am doing when I am heating water is I am just changing my temperature. My water means that it is always going to be a liquid throughout, okay? So I'm actually gonna fill in my EPH. Because it is a liquid, I know I'm gonna have two bars and I'm actually gonna end with two bars because it is a liquid. My ECH, for this class, I am always gonna keep it at one bar and it is always gonna to go to one bar, okay? I always keep it at one and one. What that shows is that yes, you have some chemical energy, but no, it is not changing. For my phases, you don't need a color. I'm, I'm just doing a lot of talking. Um, for my phases, I am going from a liquid into a liquid. For all of these LOL diagrams, what I want you guys to note is that you will only be changing either your ETH, your EPH, or your ECH for one LOL diagram. You don't wanna deal with any other changes at any other time. You want, if they're going to be going through multiple changes, then you need to do multiple LOL diagrams, okay? Um, so when we're talking about heating of water, what that means is that my ETH or my temperature is going to increase. It doesn't matter if I start with one or two or three. What I wanna do is if I'm gonna start with one, okay, what I need to make sure I do is, is that I heat it up, which means I go higher. It doesn't matter if I went to three, if I went to four, all it tells me is that I'm heating it, so I'm just gonna make sure that it, my ETH or my thermal energy went up. The next thing, or and the last thing you need to do is figure out if it, how many bars went into the system or left the system. So all you literally have to do is count the bars. So for this one, I used one, two, and one, so total I had four. On the final side, I had a total of five. So in order to go from four to five, I know I needed to add one bar of the system. Now pretend, instead I used two bars here. I went to an ETH of two bars. That means now I have six bars here, which means I do need to show that two bars entering my system. Because it is entering, it would be an endothermic process. See how you can easily identify whether it's endo or an exo? All right, and then the last one is an LOL chart for freezing of water. So freezing water, freezing means that my temperature is not changing. I'm gonna say it's pretty cold though, so I'm gonna say it's, it, it's ETH is one and one, it's not changing. My ECH is always gonna be one and one, so you should always get those points easily. And my freezing, so if I am freezing, I am going from a liquid to a solid. Liquid by definition for this unit is going to be two bars, and a solid is going to be one bar. So I'm going to go from two bars to one bar. So now I just need to figure out what's gonna go in my O. It is four bars here, it is three bars here. So what ended up happening is I lost a bar which means because it is escaping my system, remember this is your system, it is going to be exothermic. 